So my name is Chris Follett. I'm from the University of the Arts of London. Uh, to my right here is uh, Sarah Atkinson, who's from the University of Brighton. We're both uh, score fellows of the Open University. Uh, there's a store down downstairs that you can learn more about school. Uh, we're both going to give perspectives of uh, open educational resources and um, dealing mainly with rich media content um, and looking at um, those how those can come together as communities potentially to share rich media resources online. Um, I'd just like to, before I start with my slides, which were prepared uh, quite a few weeks ago, it'd be quite nice to put a little bit of context in regards to maybe some of the things that Martin Bean was saying yesterday, which um, I, I found very relevant. Um, so I'll just read a quick uh, a few notes that I made from, from that from that presentation the keynote. So it's not about hardware uh, and software, it's about brainware. Technology is an enabler. It's about creating trusted environments. Uh, the university is living, um, is learning to live in a multi-channel world. Engaged learning, uh, inspire people in informal spaces, so they move into formal spaces. And development of open education, this was something that was said that I, I would slightly contest or would maybe build on, is the development of open education must lie primarily with institution, the institutions and senior management of adoption, which I kind of agree and disagree with. Um, and the sort of balance of institutional and the grassroots. So I, I guess that's where I would uh, be going with this presentation is for us to look at the, that balance between grassroots, I don't like to use the term bottom up, so grassroots innovation and institutional adoption. So for this case study, I will um, talk about that. So I'm going to talk about Process Arts, which again was a grassroots uh, project that came out of uh, about three years ago, uh, came out of the need to uh, put resources online and to share resources across the University of Arts which is made up of six colleges. And uh, we're not very good at sharing stuff internally um, and in an open way. Um, so I went about trying to create an environment that was both institutional but also outside the institution. It could also allow um, people in, uh, allow alumni in, and allow the sort of general outside world. So an outward facing sp online space from the university. And this is Process Arts, and it's online now, and the address is up there if you'd like to visit it. Uh, anyone can join it, create an account, and join in with the, this open educational resource environment. Okay, so how did this come about? So, working with UAL, I, it's, and it can be the same for a lot of people within institutions, it's quite difficult to get service based, to work with IT infrastructures, and there was a problem in the fact that I was creating lots of video resources, um, but there was no way for me to put those resources. The only option I had was to go to YouTube, to go to a third party outside platform, um, which is fine, and I did that, um, but I, I thought that, 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 that there must be other, or a, a more sustainable future for rich media resources, uh, open educational resources. So I began to question, basically, this notion of staff creating their own siloed web spaces, uh, everything's been lost in the, in the web and uh, students are not benefiting from this, from, from the resources that maybe other tutors are making in those areas. So in 2008 I started to, to develop process starts um, and again this is where the institutional uh, bit comes in, um, secondments, fellowships, these are really useful for developing these kind of ideas. Um, and then we got a server. And that was work that took two years to get a server negotiations to actually get a, a small bit of service space in the university, which is kind of ridiculous, really. Um, hopefully, that's all going to change. <coughs> so, in a way, we've got this combined institutional and uh, grassroots activity. Um, and a lot of voluntary effort is going into uh, creating these, these 
resources and creating the space. So we've got digital stewards. So I, I'm a kind of digital steward of this space um, and supporting others into open educational practice within that space. So, um, and we've also got web making. So we've got basically a team of people that have um, been working on process arts that have become web makers and that have learned how to use open source Drupal, which is built in. From an institutional angle, we've got the support, which is again essential, plus um, the fellowships and secondments, but also we've got the strategy, so we've, we've had uh, quite a lot of strategy change or strategy, um, institutional strategies um, around communities of practice, which is really helpful. But we also were engaged in the UK OER programme, um, and we did phase two and three of that programme. And again, that really supported the uh, institutional adoption of Creative Commons licensing and maybe reviewed our IPR as well. And of course, the school fellowship was giving me a year, a year, a day, a week or two to, to develop this space. And, I, and it was very much the steward role that I took of supporting others into open educational practice. And we've also involved in the digital integration into Ars Lilla, which is the, the um, digital literacy program at GIST. And again, this is uh, really helpful uh, for supporting open educational practice. Okay, and one, one of those uh, surveys that we did on uh, in the, for the digital literacy uh, project was to maybe just take a snapshot of how uh, staff are using um, these sorts of resources in their learning and teaching. As you can see, YouTube is very popular. So this is, this is kind of supporting the argument that this is, this is all, all there is. Um, if you're any option for rich media is to go out into, into these third party environments and to put your stuff on there. So what if students don't want adverts on their YouTube videos? Um, what happens if the tutor uploads 20 videos, fantastic, the students get used to that, but the tutor leaves and then pulls that account? Um, so, again, these are the kind of questions we should be asking as an institution. Um, so, again, this is the policy change for, uh, so within this strategy, uh, you've got uh, innovation and new ideas and approaches that tend to emerge from classics activity and acknowledgement of that new university is fantastic. Here's our fire store, which again was a conventional repository system um, that was built out of the UK OER program, and again it was built out of um, quite, I'd say, clunky uh, repository software uh, that really didn't meet the needs of the sort of Web 2 environment in, 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 in my eyes and in the eyes of the project. Um, so we kind of come to the conclusion that we needed this dual social layer, and that's basically what the process art side did. So part of the digital literacy program was also to take a snapshot of the university, and we did this baseline, which is on code, and you can go visit these um, baselines for the university, which is a really handy way of understanding how the university, its current digital capacity, what it's doing good, where its gaps are. <coughs> so some of the early thoughts of, of this uh, baseline process and also some of the projects that we've run in the digital literacy program are these, which again, quite common things that are coming out. Uh, teachers fear of a learning in public. This is the online reflective practice project that we did. Uh, dealing with the discomfort of making uh, your, your curriculum resources public. Again, that's, it's quite a difficult thing for people to put their stuff out into the world. And anxiety, anxiety is related to presenting oneself in video online as well. This, this is quite common. A lot of people have been asked to make podcasts uh, and also students as well. <coughs> okay, so there's some impact from my school fellowship. So as you can see, from the beginning of the year, it was a one year school fellowship. And this is the impact on the process of, sort of being that student being that digital presence online and supporting people. You can see that a lot more people, have, there's a lot more activity in, in that space within that year. So it really helps to have real people uh, online supporting people. And as you can see, this is the kind of statistics we're talking about. So this is an unofficial service that's not officially endorsed by the university, uh, but we've got nearly 400 login users. We've got 4,000 people visiting, uh, two to 3,000 unique visitors a day, uh, sorry, a week, a month. <laughs> so, and nearly 1,500 pieces of OER content. This is a non-official UAR service. 
Okay, so I'm going to quickly just run through these slides because my tablets is nearly up. Um, so part of developing those communities was to develop these uh, communities of practice, if you like. So, so these are uh, resources, uh, groups of interest that people can put resources, cluster resources together through the interest. So if someone's doing a conference, they want to deposit all their resources from that conference, then they can create a resource here. These are online reflective practice groups, 60 videos, OER videos of staff reflecting on the practice. Um, here's a library staff, first time talking to each other online. And uh, they're developing the 23 things about who they are, so to support each other. Alumni, how do we keep alumni connected? How do we, come, how do we uh, connect with industry? Uh, this site is open, so industry can join this, staff can join this, students can join this, and we can maybe have a conversation with industry, staff and students in the same forum. Uh, individual members of staff uploading their content uh, for their coursework can create a, a community. Uh, alumni that have left but want to keep, keep connected to the university can also keep. This is all within one space, so we're all together. And fun. Uh, so this is exploring within the art context, uh, found footage, the notion of found footage, and we're using a zero license on this. Okay, so at the end of this course of fellowship, what we have now is a support area on process art for open educational practice, and that will hopefully continue into the future. I'll be talking more at the LC 2012 about the transition of process art and now going into a service and what that means because the impact of doing the school fellowship has meant that the, the site has been acknowledged more than the university and now they're looking at conversing it into a, a national service, which is great. And I'll end there. So I'm just going to step up and we'll take questions at the end. Um, there's my contact details if you'd like to find out more. I'll also be talking downstairs. six months and I spent two, two days a week during that six months investigating this area. So when I began I had a very broad remit in that I wanted to look at audiovisual media and open educational resources in relation to my own subject area which was still in media studies. And so I started to research what was out there which was very limited, I knew that already because of copyright issues, because of the way that the film industry is very closed, um, not easy to access. It was a very limited field to kind of scope in the first place, but I did come across a really rich resource, which is what I'm going to talk about today, which was the focus of my study, which was the Sally Potter Film Archive. So this is a really interesting case because it's an example of OER being created outside of an institutional context and then being accessed by the higher education institution. And they didn't generate those resources and call them OER, but they had the characteristics of them because they had Creative Commons licensing, because they're on open website platform that people could use and access it. I'll talk more about that. But just briefly, for those of you who, who won't know um, Sally Potter, she's a UK-based filmmaker, um, very prolific in film studies. She appears in the curriculum of most film studies degrees, even if it's just one lecture or reference to her work. Um, so I can talk a bit more about what her work consists of. In, in 2004, and I think this illustrates the background of, of why this resource, why Spark was born. In 2004, she made a film called Yes, and during that period, she was one of the very few film directors who was opening her process up to an outside audience, and she was doing that through blog technology. Now, today, everyone's got a blog, and you know, it's, it's obviously very widespread, but at the time, she, you know, blogging wasn't, it was very you know, um, emergent, and to say she was one of the very few kind of artists or filmmakers who were exposed to her work in this way during the production process. So it wasn't when the film was being released, it was when it was being made. And she had a two-way dialogue with film fans, answering questions, um, posting poems, creative work, and her thoughts about the film, yes. Then in 2009, she released a film called Rage, um, which was the first film 
had to be released on mobile phones. So you can choose, choose filmmaker who's very much interested in exploring those new technologies and their abilities to open up different visual aesthetics, different styles, and different types of audience engagement. So it's a very high profile film, so I'm Judy Dench, Jude Law, amongst others. Um, as I say, it wasn't a traditional release, it was given away for free on mobile phones. So that kind of um, approach to her work, coupled with the fact that she's much studied in film studies, um, and received a lot of requests on a daily basis to access her work in her archives, led to the creation of Spark. So she's obviously got reams and reams of um, background work. There's the scripts, there's handwritten kind of notes, development notes, the film itself, still images, mood boards, you know, the whole kind of visual output of the creative process is stored away in boxes and file cabinets. So here's some storyboards from the film Orlando, Two stars of Sweden. Um, this is a contract, a handwritten contract on that thing. Um, production schedules, all the other family that relates to film production, production stills themselves, and then a finished film. And so when they decided what they were going to do with this material to allow access, they're a very small production company. They have one office in East London and very limited staff, so they couldn't really open doors and allow physical access. So they decided to think about new ways of allowing that access online. And also to think of ways to capitalise on people's use of the archive. In a physical archive, it's a very singular experience. One person goes in, finds resources, takes their results away. They don't leave footprints through the archive of where they've been or traces of what they've done. The materials are simply placed back into the shelf and that kind of information, that provenance is lost. So what they established um, three years ago now was a WordPress site which basically brought together archives and social networking. So what they did was bring all the resources from Orlando into this arena, allow people to view them, but allow then people to record what they viewed so that other people could use them. So this is a social networking feature that they called Pathways. So it basically recorded people's pathways through the archive that could be then looked at by other users. So people didn't have to repeat processes. They could start by looking at somebody else's routes through the materials. And so every asset that they put in has got various different tags and comments, so there's different ways of searching the archive. Um, and that's when they kind of established this film school out of the box because they realised the power that this had and so many universities wanted to, to get on board and to use the resource. Um, it's now been used as an assessment tool, so as part of my um, fellowship when I came on board in September was to work directly from the Adventure Pictures production offices and work with various different universities in setting up assessments and course activities and supporting them in the use of Spark. There's also another way of, of, of accessing the archive through a visual browser um, which has been made which allows you to follow colour patterns throughout the film. And then this is the latest version of Spark which was released in February this year so this is the version that we're now working to which is far more sophisticated than the WordPress site and allows more functionality including this visual browser that you can see on the screen there. So these are just screen graphs from the site and what you can see on the left hand side is a taxonomy of the whole production process so those familiar with film studies can access all the different documents by knowing where they've been in that taxonomy from pre-production right through to post-production. Then you can access through tags, but also this is the, the kind of key to the social networking capabilities of this resource is the pathways that can be used. So you can see underneath this particular asset, which is a black and white still image, all the different people who've viewed that and what they've kind of annotated it with. So there's the opportunity to basically add notes, annotations to that. And that's what then became the, the assessments that the students did. They were set the task of building a pathway that explored a specific theme around films that could lead to textuality or adaptation because obviously one of those is an adaptation from a Virginia Woolf novel. So students have been exploring it in lots of different ways and then the output of that activity is the pathway that they've been submitted. This is just another quick way of kind of searching the archive, so the advanced search features as well. So I don't have that much time left. So just to summarise my school fellowship activity, I worked with five different universities that had already started to engage with Sally Potter in the curriculum, and then I've helped to develop how they use a work within the curriculum and how they use Spark. And these are just two examples of assignments that were, that were set up during the process of my fellowship. The first one, very traditional, 
as I mentioned, to use it in an analysis of adaptation in the film. Um, and then the second assignment was a bit more challenging in terms of looking at what film was in the digital age, but also looking at what an archive could be in the digital age. And you can see from the last slide, the, the chief actually um, forbade the student from using adaptation and to find, make new discoveries and, and new um, levels of analysis. And this is just to highlight the level of activity um, around the time that I was engaging with these universities. And you can see from that two quite significant figures that the pages per visit increased, you know, trebled. So far more people have a far more in-depth engagement with the archive and using it to a high level and staying in there for a longer period of time. So the average visit duration also increased. Um, I looked at some focus groups to find out how people had responded to the archive um, in order to feed back to adventure pictures that could develop it in the future. Um, and students were very much empowered by the fact that they could first of all see primary materials. I think I started off the presentation by saying it's a very closed area. These access to such materials are very, very limited because of copyright um, and legal issues. So the fact that students could actually get hold of primary materials in the digital arena and use them and make their own levels of analysis was far more exciting and inspirational to them than picking up a book and reading a, a film academics reading or some materials that could actually see that. And they could see the overlap, they could see how the film was created in the background to that um, by looking at the finished film alongside all its component parts. So clearly Spark has, has lots of benefits as an OER that I've highlighted. Um, both staff and students really kind of wanted to get on board and, and work with this and it really did facilitate a deeper engagement with materials and the, the area of film studies. So just to briefly end the presentation, um, that's kind of not the end. It's the end of my fellowship, unfortunately, but we're taking this work forwards now um, because at the time that I joined Spark, they were going into the latest production of Sally's new film, which is due to release in October this year. Um, it's got quite a high profile cast um, from Christina Hendricks, Timothy Spall, Annette Benning, and it was shot on location in London. So we really have a unique opportunity to think about how that film could be archived before it's even archived, which is quite an unusual situation to be in because mainly archives relate to directors or people that are deceased and it's actually someone that's living and can inform how a work can be accessed. So what we actually did was interview everybody who's been involved in the film, which currently doesn't exist in the archive as it is, but now we have this opportunity as it was in production to basically speak to everybody from the runners, right up to the directors, the stunts, the special effects, the caterers, the financiers, the legal advisors, the distributors, are all still being interviewed as we speak, and then that will be entered into the archive as, as further OER. Um, that's it. So I think we've both got the Yeah, well, I th this is the problem for, for, for most staff, I think, is to, is to make those first steps. And I think it's important that they do make those first steps. And I think the decisions that are made. So the scenario is, uh, I, I get emails quite regularly, actually, from staff saying that they would, that, that they could either use a space like this, but what if this didn't exist? Uh, or if they wanted to create a space that just communicated with their cohort, the sort of web space, just to share stuff. Uh, so, again, that's the, the, almost forced into this, you've got to go outside the university. You've got to go and buy a Ning account or something like that. And, the, the, and I think that's the problem, is, is that institutions are not thinking about supporting current technology. And, um, and if we don't, uh, what happens in five years' time, in ten years' time, um, when everything's out in, in commercial providing open platforms, open institutional platforms that are maybe a bit more stable and a bit, maybe a bit a better experience for the students, maybe more accessible. So is that a point that you want to have an open access area built into the university's um, system, do you think? Yes, I, I, I think that is the ideal scenario. I, I think 
at the moment we're, we're looking at this sort of pri our primary rich media repository systems are external commercial systems and we should be looking at the primary system being our internal open platforms not closed open platforms rich media platforms and then that the external commercial platforms are purely channels in order to you know we've got 200,000 hits on YouTube on some of the sandcasting videos. That's fantastic. But you can always, if, the, if those YouTube videos ever disappear, you can always track back to the university and find those sandcasting videos. And I think that's, that's, that's the problem, especially when we're looking at thousands of resources. I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> so. So, so the first steps are, I, I, I guess, uh, I'll just to give it a go and, and then maybe to ask those questions of, of your institution to say, what, what are you providing for me to, to engage in, in technology? Any more questions? So um, downstairs there's two stands, there's the score stand and we'll be on that this afternoon. So, so we'll be on that. I'll also be on the, the HEA stand. I'm not sure if you've seen that. There's an HEA OER stand. So if you'd like a more informal chat, please come and see us there. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs>